Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1993 film Return of the Living Dead Part 3, uh, or just Return of the Living Dead 3, if you're normal. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I said it that way. I think because 2 is technically Part 2, so this is just 3. So I did do reviews for the first one and the second one. They are available on my channel. Check it out. I think I actually might make a playlist for that because I think I'll keep going and do 4 and 5 and then just have the complete playlist of my reviews for those. So look for that. Um, when this is going up, there will only be three in that playlist if I if I remember to create that. So anyway, watch those other reviews. Um, so let's talk about this one. Directed by Brian Usna. I am a fan of Brian Usna. I think he does a good job. Mainly because of the film Society, which I just discovered maybe two years ago-ish, somewhere in that realm. I had heard some things about it online, seen about it... Uh, read some articles about it in like Rue Morgue magazine, which I've been reading for about 12 years or so, and was like, well, if they're talking about it, definitely got to see it. And that film is crazy. So Brian Yuza not only did this film Society, which is nuts, and you must see if you have it, and it's available on Shudder, I think still. Um, which, by the way, Return of the Living Dead 3 is on Shudder at the moment when I'm putting out this review. So uh, Yuzna also was, also was involved in all the reanimator films. He was involved in the writing of the script for the first Reanimator, and then he directed Bride of Reanimator and Beyond Reanimator. Yeah, I always get it switched up. Is it Reanimator, Beyond, or Beyond Reanimator? It is Beyond Reanimator. So uh, there are a lot of kind of themes that seep into this film from Society and from the Reanimator films. Uh, one of the main things being there's kind of like a Frankenstein-ish aspect to it, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and then there's a lot of like body horror type stuff going on a la, a la uh, Cronenberg, uh, but Yuzna did a lot of that in society as well. So that's the aspect of society and the Frankenstein stuff is the aspect of reanimator kind of seeping into this film. Uh, the script for this was actually written by John Penny, who did, I haven't seen these films, but just some examples of other ones. He wrote The Power, The Kindred, and Legend of the Mummy. So I don't know. Let me know if you've seen those. Put some comment down there. I want to say up front, Melinda Clark, who plays Julie in this film, I thought did a very good job for a very demanding role. That that role of Julie, really, really tough. Uh, definitely the toughest role in the film, in my opinion. So it's estimated that the budget for this film was about $2 million. And I don't know if this is right, but the, the figure I found for how much it made into the box office was a bit over $54,000, which would be a horrible flop of a film which I know it didn't do well but I don't know if that's a true representation of how poorly it did hopefully not but you know th this is one of those films in my opinion that ages a lot better you know there are plenty of films that come out and they totally get panned and no one cares about them really and then as time goes on people rediscover them and are like oh my gosh this is such a great film and then they look it up and they're like it flopped when it came out nobody liked it you know, it just happens. So Yuzna actually wanted the character of Julie to have a much larger screen presence because he felt like he didn't get enough screen time for the monster in Bride of Reanimator. Which, by the way, Bride of Reanimator at the moment is on Shudder as well. Not Beyond Reanimator, but Bride of Reanimator. And I think the original Reanimator is still on there, although it may have cycled off. I don't know. Look for that. Um, Julie's makeup actually was 100 different pieces that had to be put in. So I think it was said that it took about eight hours to put her whole look together, but they ended up over time getting it shaved down to about six hours. So, but it, it, it's intricate. And, and the moment when, when that's kind of revealed is a really nice moment. So all that work, in my opinion, worth it. So reportedly Yuzma, Yuzna actually wanted to do a Return of the Living Dead sequel for years and years and years. So when the, the, the time came for this one to actually get made, he was their go-to. He was the first director that they went to. So I think it came out well. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm still getting over some. So obviously at the time the film came out, it was, it was a flop. It didn't do well, but... Over time, it's aged quite well. But you know what? That doesn't do a whole lot for the studios, unfortunately. So, Or the studio, Trimark. Brian Peck is actually the only actor who's been in all three of the first... Well, three of the of the uh, Return of the Living Dead films. Uh, he played Scuzz in the first one, and then he played a bunch of different zombies in the second one. 
Uh, there five. There were five different special effects companies that were used for this film, and the reason for that being they had a really short time for shooting. It was twenty four days total, and in addition to that, they also had two separate film crews so that they could, you know, keep going and get all the shots they wanted to. So um, yeah, they were really packing it in and making it work. A lot actually ended up having to be cut to get an R rating. Initially, it was like an unrated cut, and that's how it came out on VHS. And then they wanted an R-rated, so they uh, used and I had to cut a lot out, unfortunately. One thing people didn't actually like at the release of this is that a lot of the comedic aspects were taken out of the films. It's where in the first and second one, there's a lot of intentional comedy to it. Uh, Yuzna decided not to go that direction, and he went more serious, more in-depth, and he put more themes into the film. Which, in my opinion, I mean, obviously it's a bold move. Obviously it didn't do well when it came out. But I think it ages well for that reason. And I kind of, I have a note in here, so hopefully I don't repeat it when I get to it. But uh, basically, I think this is a film that if it was done again, like the same script, done the same way, same directing, all that, but with better acting nowadays, I think it would play a lot better. Because it is a good film. There are a lot of themes there. The problem is there's a lot of, there's just like this film of like corniness over the whole thing because a lot of these performances are just not very good. It's a very like, even though it was in the early 90s, it feels like very 80s acting performances. And some of the dialogue is, is corny like that too. So um, yeah, I think if this was updated, I think if it was redone with much better acting today, I think it would do really, really well in my opinion because it, it offers new things to, to the zombie film. And like I said, like this was a bold move for John Penny and, and Brian Usna to, to to go in the direction that they did with this film, especially seeing what the first two were. Uh, it didn't pay off financially, but in my opinion, it paid off in the long run, artistically. Uh, it does continue the theme, basically, of gov the government being stupid and kind of leading to a zombie epidemic. That's the same in the first two, so that was kept consistent. Uh, as soon as you see the, see the trioxin barrel in this film, it's kind of like, okay, here we go. Here we go. Let's get the let's get the zombies going. But here's the thing about it. There aren't a ton of zombies in this until the end. The very, very end is where it's kind of like this explosion of zombie mayhem and craziness. And that's where you see the most zombies. But up until that point, there really aren't many zombies. It's not like the first two where it's just like, Okay, the trioxin hits all the dead, boom, zombies, and it's just like an onslaught for pretty much the whole film. This one, it's a lot slower. Um, it has a lot less zombies, but I would argue that the it, it's a quality over quantity situation with the zombies because it doesn't have a lot of zombies, but the zombies that show up earlier on until the very, very end are really well put together. Like, the designs are cool. There was a lot of thought that went into that, especially, obviously, Julie, who I guess isn't, I mean, she is a zombie, but she's not like a full zombie. She's more conscious and, and kind of like a human. She's kind of in the middle. She's like part human, part zombie at that point. So uh, the idea they introduce in this one about zombies needing brains for the electricity in the brains is a really interesting one because it makes you think about the legitimate thing of like brain death. Like is a person actually dead? Is their, is their brain expired? Um, it gives you the idea that basically what's going on is that they're, they're feeding on the brains to get that electricity, to keep the electricity in their own brains going so that they don't experience a second brain death. So it gives you the idea that if they don't eat within a certain amount of time, not knowing what that time really is, they would just die again and be done and they wouldn't be able to come back. So I know a lot of the times in the films, it's, it, it's kind of, um, it's always as like a hunger but in this one, they, they put like an explanation behind the hunger, which I thought was bold and interesting. And I really like that, that aspect of it. Um, wouldn't these people know by now that when they're doing the experiment, they, they get the first uh, dead guy and they put the trioxin on him and he, you know, zombifies and gets loose and starts biting. Wouldn't they know at this point that anyone that he bites is coming back as a zombie and, and they should be very, very careful. You would think that they would because the insinuation is they've they've cleaned this up. The government has cleaned this up twice now. So this is the third go around. So they should have this information. But then again, this goes back to the whole theme in the films of the government doing bold and stupid things and just not smart. 
Um, Julie's fixation on death early on in this film is a very strong foreshadowing of her actual demise and then eventual zombification. Uh, I put, she wanted to know what the zombie was experiencing and now she will. So I, I like that strong foreshadowing how she was so fixated on death. That kind of goes back to, oh crap, what's her name in the first one? Is it Spider in the first one? Linnea Quigley's character. Um, she's so like fixated on death. Um, very similar, uh, yeah, Julie's just all about death. She's she's wondering, like, she wants to be in the head of that zombie and know what they're going through. And that's exactly what happens. She finds out. And she she ends up verbalizing that a lot throughout the film. And that's one of the most interesting things about the film, in my opinion, is how much it focuses on her struggle and her changes. And specifically her mental and, and physical struggle to hold on to as much of her humanity as she can versus just switching right over. Which in the first two films, they, they pretty much just switch over to zombies and there's not a ton of fight that goes on. With a few characters, there is a little bit that goes on, but um, not to the degree that, that hers does. And not with that focus on her inner emotions and physical feelings. Um, I wrote, distracted driving can be a real killer. People are talk told about this all the time. Um, when he's like on the motorcycle and she's like groping his crotch and then, hey, that's how, how uh, issues happen here. And then she like f flipped off it and right into that telephone pole. And when I was watching, I just thought, oh man, this is hereditary before hereditary. Does anyone get it out there? Yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. But anyway, um, when, uh, this, this film kind of shows what happens when hopeless romantic meets idiot teenager then you get the zombie epidemic. Obviously, the government has to be involved first to, you know, make that stuff accessible. But obviously, it's because Kurt decides that this is the love of his life. He can't do without her. And much like in, you know, something like Pet Cemetery, he knows something can go terribly wrong, but he cannot resist. He must bring her back and see what happens. Also happens in the reanimator films as well, that type of stuff. So these things being echoed consistently through film. Kurt learns really fast and, and in a very extreme way that people change in relationships and relationships are complicated. That's, I think, kind of one of the themes in this is relationships in general and how people don't always stay the same. They change. You know, obviously, this is a very uh, intense, extreme uh, theme. Um, what am I? What's the word I'm looking for? Metaphor, a very intense and extreme metaphor for that. But um, that's what it goes to show. Uh, everything's great and everything's going well. And then this major, uh, I guess, road bump in their relationship happens. And they need to figure out how they're going to work through that. And in the end, they do because he's going to end up going through the exact same thing. And they kind of re they kind of reconnect there and get back together. I mean, if you watch the film, it's it's a it's an entire lifespan of a teenage relationship. And they work things out in the end. <laughs> Not in a happy way, really, but they do. I love how the crazy sewer dweller guy gives Kurt advice for living, going, you know, going out and living his dreams. And Kurt is like intently listening and into it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's totally listening to that guy. And I was like, what the heck? And then the idea behind that Mardi Gras coin that he gives him. I mean, I know it comes up much later in the film as like, look at this, recognize me. We were friends. So he doesn't kill him. And that's, I don't really like that aspect aspect of it coming up, um, but I do like the idea behind what he was saying about the Mardi Gras coin, about you know passing it along and doing something good for another person, and then just knowing that that coin is circulating throughout society, knowing that people are doing good for each other. It's actually a really cool message, but the pro problem is it gets lost in the fact that the actor who's delivering the lines is so extra with his crazy and the way he delivers those lines that it just seems like a joke and it seems stupid and ridiculous. But if you actually listen to what the dialogue is and the idea of what he's saying, it's actually very touching and a great idea. It's just one of those delivery issues. This goes back to what I was saying earlier about if they would have better acting in the film and fix some of the dialogue and update it now, it could be awesome. People could love this. It's a cool concept that Julie can keep herself from losing it by inflicting pain upon herself. And it's also interesting that at first she's just doing it for necessity and then it kind of morphs to this. She she finds, she like feels pleasure when she's doing it. And it's kind of that mixing of um, pleasure and pain, like a like an S&M type thing 
that is played on heavily in the Hellraiser films. And that's what it reminded me of a lot, especially when they reveal her look after she's, you know, kind of stuck things in herself um, a lot. You know, that 100-piece uh, makeup uh, look. And it she reminded me a lot of a Cenobite at that point, the way she looked. The design of it is great. Like, it looks amazing. It's very, very impressive. It's this mix of, like, sexy and scary and gross and, like, badass. And, once again, that's why it makes me think of, like, the Hellraiser films and Cenobites. Like, I feel like it connects very, very well with that. And I love the Hellraiser films, so. I haven't done any reviews on any. Yeah, no, I haven't. And I, I will at some point. I need to get to that. So, yeah, the re the reveal of Julie's finely modded body, I thought they set that up really well. It was a really cool moment. Probably the best moment in the film, in my opinion. Um, there aren't any zombies in this. Uh, or, I'm sorry, not any. Many zombies in this, but oh, this is just my whole thing about quality over quantity. I really do like the design of the early on zombies they have. It gets a little bit less so at the very end when it's just that explosion of zombie craziness, but... Um, I bet a lot of people really didn't like the fact that, one, this film was focused a lot on relationships and romance. Two, it seemed pretty slow at times, and it really did. And three, it wasn't about, like, this overrunning of zombies until the very, very end. Which, by the way, when you have that moment at the end where it's just, like, the the big payoff, and it kind of feels a little bit like a big payoff... Um, it also makes the film feel very, very uneven at the same time because it's much, much slower, 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 slower. And like, that's the film, that's the pace. And then it gets to the end and it's just like crazy and faster. And so you're just like, shouldn't this have been like a little bit more scattered throughout the film instead of just blowing it up right here? So I don't know, it, it has pacing problems, but you know. If this film, yeah, like I said, if this film was done now, could be great. Yuzna, if you ever see this, which you won't. Try and get this redone. Do it again. Do it again. Um, so going to some of the thematic stuff that I was talking about. Um, yeah, definite Frankenstein feel, like I was saying, ties back into the reanimator films, which makes sense because of Yuzna, but also tying back to society with all like the body modification and stuff like that. He does some Cronenberg-ish things, which society does as well. Uh, ultimately, this film is actually all about relationships, romantic and familial. And that's probably why part of it well, probably a large reason why people didn't really like this, because like I was saying before, like consider the fact that the first two films are just all about gore and violence and over the top and comedy. And then you bring this in and there are a lot of themes that are very heavy in this and very serious and the comedy's gone. And yeah, it's, I mean, it's still got the gore and the violence and the cool like zombie moments, but there are less zombies too. So the people were expecting the formula on the, in this third one, and they didn't get it. And I say, kudos to you, Yuzna and Penny, for you know bucking the trend. I know it didn't pay off short term, but long term, I think it did. Um, mm -mm -mm. This could be seen as the worries about the youth of America, actually, uh, impulsive and reckless. Uh, you the it's kind of the the societal worry that happens all the time about you know, generations thinking that these younger generations are going to destroy themselves, but they're not just going to destroy themselves. They're going to destroy the rest of society with them. You know, you see a lot of that right now with the whole um, millennials thing, millennials versus boomers ordeal. And people are saying, um, you know, oh, these kids these days, but that's like, that's always been a thing. Like generations are always like that. The, every generation uh, by and large, has a tendency to look at the generations that come after them and say, oh, they're not as good as us because this, or they're messing up the world because of this. And it's not just them messing up their lives. They're going to mess up our lives too because we live in it with them. And they're going to inherit, you know, all the, you know, positions of power in politics and it, with uh, companies and, you know, all that jazz. So I think it plays a little bit to that as well, which is something that's been in film a lot. Because it's a thing in society, definitely. So that's actually, um, that's it for me covering Return of the Living Dead 3. Now I have to give it my star rating. I, uh, the, it has flaws, like I talked about. There are a lot of problems. Like I said, mainly the, the pacing is a really big issue to it. Um, and the acting is a big issue. But there's so much there. Uh, and they tried to do so much. And it's serious and it's interesting. And I really like a lot of the different things that that Yuzna and Penny tried to do with this and I, I think it works a lot and 
I, I hope that other people kind of see that in the film. So out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it a three and a half. I, w I wanted to initially give it a three because of all of its flaws, but because of how unique it is and how many risks they took, I'm bumping it to a three and a half. Um, I think it works and I like it. So anyway, uh, thanks everyone for checking this one out. I will be doing four and five. I don't know how soon or I don't know. But like I said, I'm going to create that playlist so the first three are available. Uh, put some comments down here about Return of the Living Dead 3. I know it's become kind of a cult, has a cult following now. So I want to hear from some other people who like it and why. Maybe some pe other people who still don't like it and why. That'd be great. Uh, do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe. That's your best way to pay me back if you like any of the videos that I do. Because I'm not making money on this. I'm just you know doing it as a hobby. So encouragement is everything. If you've already subscribed... Hit that like, just let me know you're still watching. You could also do subscribe and a like if you wanted to. Do that. Oh, and also, if you if you have subscribed or if you're going to subscribe, hit the notification bell because then that lets you know as soon as I put up new videos and then you can go and watch them and it helps them get better traction. So anyway, thanks for checking this one out. And until next time, keep it brutal.